Hello and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Mixed Messages, Black British Cultural Studies. Understandably, we academics are often teased by the general public. It's easy to accuse us of living cloistered lives in an ivory tower, caught up in our own ideas, instead of engaging with real life. Ironically enough, though, nothing provokes derision so easily as academic work that does engage with an aspect of real life, as lived by most people, what goes by the name of popular culture. If you mention at a party that you're writing a doctoral thesis on Immanuel Kant or Shakespeare, your fellow guests will be impressed, though they might hurry to change the topic. But if you say you're doing your thesis on RuPaul's Drag Race or Taylor Swift, or the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you may well encounter a few raised eyebrows, which doesn't really make sense. After all, if you want to understand the world, why would you choose to ignore what is popular within it? It thus seems worthwhile to ponder not only what ancient Indian philosophers thought about karma, but also what Swift means in her hit song Karma when she tells us, karma is my boyfriend. Of course, teasing out the deeper significance of pop culture down to the level of depth that would merit a doctorate or publication in academic journals is no easy matter. Indeed, it sounds like it would require special intellectual tools. Unfortunately, there is a whole branch of academic study designed to supply just such tools. It's called cultural studies. It will hardly have escaped your attention that we have some sympathy with cultural studies and its willingness to take popular culture seriously. After all, we've devoted a good deal of attention to popular music, including funk, reggae, and Afrobeat. In some of these episodes, we even mentioned the work of scholars likely to be put under the heading of cultural studies, like Kodwo Eshun, one of our guides to the alien world of Afrofuturism. But cultural studies has an even more intimate connection with Africana thought than we have suggested thus far, especially in Britain. Eshun himself was born in London to a Ghanaian family, But going further back, there is the man who did as much as anyone to establish cultural studies in Britain in the first place. This was Stuart Hall, who was from Jamaica. To be specific, he was born in Kingston in 1932. As he relates in his posthumously published autobiography called Familiar Stranger, which was put together and published by his collaborator Bill Schwartz, Hall grew up in a middle-class family, shielded from the poverty and precarity of what he thought of as the real Jamaica. He was an excellent student and secured a Rhodes Scholarship, which took him to Oxford University in 1951. This made him part of the Windrush Generation, named after a ship that had taken immigrants to Britain three years earlier, though, as Hall himself notes, he arrived under very different circumstances than the migrant workers who made up most of that generation. Hall went on to edit an important periodical called the New Left Review, teaching at first in high school and then in higher academia. From 1968 to 1979, he was director of the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies in Birmingham before moving on to the Open University, where he taught until 1997. The CCCS in Birmingham was a relatively small research institute with a handful of staff and a few dozen graduate students, but its influence has been anything but small. Direct graduates of the CCCS include, among other significant scholars, Paul Gilroy and Hazel Carby, whom we'll be discussing later in this episode. Hall's autobiography and the not infrequent references to his own life story in his many essays make it abundantly clear that his upbringing in Jamaica was decisive for the approach he took in cultural studies. He says that he came from the margins, a metaphor we've also seen in Bell Hooks, and adds that he was aware of living on the hinge between the colonial and post-colonial worlds. As we'll see, this is a major theme, indeed the major theme, of his work, and one that is picked up by successors, like Gilroy. For Hall, cultures are not monolithic structures to which one either does or does not belong, like a club that literally has card-carrying members. Rather, cultures and traditions overlap and interpenetrate. A diasporic individual like Hall lives inside and outside multiple cultures simultaneously, hence the subtitle of his autobiography, A Life Between Two Islands. Hall experienced this even before he came to the UK, as when he was thrilled to discover modern literature and art by painters like Picasso and Clay, something he compares to encountering a snowstorm in a Caribbean summer. Moving to Britain only sharpened his sense of what he calls 
the complex inner relations of this late phase of colonialism. As his intellectual career developed, Hall took inspiration from the work of the Italian Marxist theoretician Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci gave him the insight that popular culture is, in Hall's words, a contradictory space in which rival social and political forces or ideologies struggle for dominance. Rather than overtly oppressing other groups by using violence or the threat of violence, a dominant ideology uses cultural products to secure what Gramsci called hegemony. This just means that its worldview is the one that holds sway by pushing some things to the forefront and pushing others into the background or out of sight completely. Thus, the ideas disseminated most successfully by what is sometimes called the culture industry, for instance in radio, film, or television, are the ones that become hegemonic, at least until different ideas supplant them. This already shows why it would be very much worth our while to think about, say, box office smashes or top charting music. It's precisely in the most popular culture that we might expect to find the ideology that is currently winning the never-ending battle for cultural supremacy. Think, for example, about how 1950s and 1960s television communicated ideas about capitalism and the nuclear family, or about how, for so much of Hollywood history, black people were rarely depicted positively or as leading figures on the big screen. That the message was conveyed implicitly, or even by omission, with no house husbands and no black action heroes, made the message all the more powerful. It would be easy to assume that the everyday cultural consumer is purely passive in this process, simply being spoon-fed whatever ideas a cultural elite decides to feed them. But this is wrong on two counts, according to Hall. First, because the hegemonic elite is not consciously weaving its ideology into film scripts or pop music lyrics, it doesn't have to, because its influence is much deeper than that, and infuses the very images, words, and structures that fill the media. To use the same examples, it simply wouldn't have occurred to the average 1950s television scriptwriter to have the mother work and the father stay home in Leave It to Beaver, or to have Beaver be African American. In the early 1960s, a film like the Doris Day comedy The Thrill of It All does imagine a woman going out to work, but the happy ending consists of the main character gladly returning to her existence as a housewife. Presumably, the writers were not consciously trying to indoctrinate female viewers, but thought of themselves simply as offering entertainment. That is one reason the indoctrination had a good chance of working. But not a guarantee of working, which brings us to the second mistake. It is wrong to think of the audience as passive. As Hall bluntly puts it, people are not cultural dopes. In more theoretical terms, he distinguishes between a structuralist approach that focuses on how hegemony communicates its message in a top-down way, and a culturalist approach, that focuses on how the audience receives the message. Characteristically, Hall wants to make use of both approaches at the same time and sees them as complementary. To see how this would work, we can turn to his much-read essay called Encoding and Decoding in the Television Discourse. It was first written in 1973, but has lost none of its relevance. Indeed, 21st century technologies like streaming services have made it even more possible for audiences to do what Hall already noticed them doing in the early 1970s, namely to exert control over and resist the messages that would-be hegemonic groups are trying to convey. As Hall puts it, there is distortion or a lack of symmetry between the message being broadcast and the message as it is actually received. He gives an example that might now seem old-fashioned until you realize that it could easily be updated and applied to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the depiction of violence in westerns. On the face of it, showing white-hatted cowboys killing black-hatted bad guys seems to tell audiences that violence is acceptable as a way to maintain law and order and punish moral failings. But, as Hall observes, the narrative form has become so familiar, even cliched, that it would no longer be read that way by many audience members. Instead, they might see it as a mere game, with no moral significance at all. Or they might see the quick-drawing gunslinger as epitomizing professionalism rather than the triumph of good over evil. Of course, sometimes the hegemonic ideology does succeed in conveying its message, what Hall calls the preferred meaning, but often enough, the audience reinterprets that meaning or actively resists it. We might imagine kids in the 1950s playing out what they've seen on TV but reversing the script with a little girl play acting going to work while her brother pretends to stay home and cook. As that example shows, Hall's theory is applicable to a topic that has frequently occupied us here on the podcast, identity. The little girl we just imagined resists the preferred meaning as regards gender 
and the same thing can happen with nationhood or race. For Hall, it is axiomatic that identities are socially constructed and hence, as he puts it, always in the process of formation. It is wrongheaded to imagine that we will ever discover who we really are because we are always renegotiating our relationships with others, always trying out ways of belonging to or opposing cultural, social, and political groups. So, as Hall says about the quest to arrive at the true self, this arrival never occurs, we'll never be ourselves, whatever that means. Thus, and drawing here on Franz Fanon, Hall thinks that an identity like race is a site of struggle and antagonism. In a racist society, the hegemonic ideology would have it that the white race is superior to the black race. This is an ideology bound up with class, both because black people are disproportionately socioeconomically disadvantaged, and because race can be used to divide the working class against itself, with poor whites refusing to make common cause with poor blacks. As Hall puts it, class structures work through race and are its modality, meaning that it is through one's feeling of racial identity that one experiences one's class identity. But this ideology, like the implicit messages in a 1950s TV show, can be resisted. Hall knew this from his own experience. Growing up in Jamaica when he did, he says, no one thought of themselves as black. Skin color was certainly relevant, but there were many shades with different names and meanings, rather than a Manichaean racial universe of blacks and whites, like the hats worn by cowboys. It was only Hall's discovery of the black power movement that gave him the notion of being black, and made him feel that he wanted to identify with it. So in this case, Hall only engaged with the hegemonic master concept of blackness by resisting it, by seeing blackness as something to be proud of, not a mark of inferiority. He remembers feeling, I want that term, that negative one, that's the one I want. The powerful connections between Hall's life story and his theories of culture make it clear that he was one academic who was not living in an ivory tower. As he once said, abstract theory as such is always a detour to something more interesting. And while his essays are often pitched at an advanced theoretical level, Hall was also involved with larger research projects that engage with current political and social events. Usually, these projects were pursued collaboratively, this being a hallmark, if you'll pardon the expression, of his work at the CCCS. One example was a study of the British government's reaction to a supposed wave of muggings in the 1970s. Hall and his team saw it as a moral panic connected to a real wave of racist paranoia. As many British listeners will know, the leading paranoid racist of the time was Enoch Powell, a politician who remains famous for his anti-immigrant Rivers of Blood speech. The CCCS noted that, in fact, crime statistics had been improving rather than worsening in the time leading up to the government crackdown on muggings, which suggested to them that this panic was really about something else. They also observed that the culprits were typified as lower-income young black men. The connection between Powell's racist rhetoric and the panic over muggings was then not so difficult to spot. More subtle was the insight that this and other moral panics are mechanisms by which diffuse social fears are brought to focus on a specific group, an enemy within the gates, with the non-white immigrant community offering the perfect target. As a kind of bonus side effect, the government can use the moral panic as a pretext for expanding its own powers of state control, something Hall called popular authoritarianism. Again, though this work was all done in the late 1970s, it provides a compelling analysis of events that occurred nearly 50 years later. Hall died in 2014, and he lived just a little longer, he would have been supremely unsurprised at the spectacle of a media personality stoking a moral panic over immigration to bring popular authoritarianism to the White House. If Black British cultural studies sometimes seem to predict the future, it could also be used to understand the past. This is something shown in the work of the two aforementioned doctoral students from Birmingham, Paul Gilroy and Hazel Carby. Both of them applied the insights pioneered by Hall to some of the same material we've surveyed in this podcast series, looking back to 19th century Africana thought. Indeed, Gilroy's books, There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack, from 1987, and The Black Atlantic, from 1993, provide a model for the approach we've taken here on the podcast. Like our series, Gilroy moves across the Black world, considering thinkers and cultural phenomena in both the diaspora and Africa itself. Though our approach is somewhat more capacious, since Gilroy does not much deal with French, Portuguese, or Spanish language texts and places. As its title suggests, There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack focuses largely on Britain, 
but here he already anticipates the idea of a Black Atlantic by talking about its four nodes, namely the Caribbean, United States, Europe, and Africa. That voice you might hear in the background is Chike asking, uh, what about Canada? In There Ain't No Black, Gilroy uses analytical tools developed by Hall to explore ideas with which Hall would be in sympathy. Race is a social and cultural construct, but has real effects. Its nature changes across time and place, so that we must think in terms of historically specific racisms in the plural, not one fixed thing called racism. And above all, like any culturally encoded ideology, racist ideology can be identified, analyzed, negotiated, and resisted. For a brilliant example of identification and analysis, we might mention Gilroy's discussion of a magazine advertisement taken out by the Conservative Party. It shows a young black man wearing a suit. He's far from a mugger, more like a banker. The accompanying text says, Labor says he's black. Tories say he's British. With conservatives, there are no blacks or whites, just people. This is an early example of racists helping themselves to the language of racial equality. Yet again, we can easily think of similar tactics in the modern day, and Gilroy's reading of it reveals its hypocrisy. Effectively, the Tories were here saying, implicitly of course, that black people are British too, and people too, so long as they act like Tories. For example, the man's outfit, which one in this context can only describe as conservative, conveys that the black readership was being invited to forsake all that marks them out as culturally distinct before real Britishness can be guaranteed. Here, Gilroy was, as Hall would put it, offering resistance to the preferred meaning. But you don't need to get a PhD in Birmingham to do that. Gilroy argues that Black British people in general resist being pigeonholed within race conceived as an ahistorical essence. Because these people have come from many different places, their community, or communities, are intrinsically diverse. They also identify with Britishness, if not fully. This is exactly the sort of experience described by Hall in his autobiography, and Gilroy uses similar language to describe it, talking of the way that diasporic culture undermines constricting national boundaries and involves a constant interchange between periphery and center. For Gilroy, as for Hall, the autonomy and creativity of diasporic peoples show that their situation is not wholly determined by economic forces, as classical Marxist theory would have it, of course, class is connected to race, as Hall too had argued, but once people start to think of themselves as belonging to a certain race, they can use that to form communities, build coalitions, and mount political resistance. So they are not just doomed to occupy the subordinate socioeconomic position envisioned for them by the hegemonic dominating ideology. That point is central to The Black Atlantic, a book that is as lengthy, dense, and difficult as it is important. One critic has rightly said that it is impossible to skim or easily summarize, though this critic goes on to give a pretty good summary by saying that it is Gilroy's heroic effort to create a new cultural narrative for people of the African diaspora to replace the grand narratives of both Afrocentrism and Western modernity. Let's see if we can expand on that a bit. We might start with the subtitle, Modernity and Double Consciousness, and its evident allusion to W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois is only one of several classic Africana thinkers to receive extensive discussion in the book. He is particularly important because the concept of double consciousness is so helpful to Gilroy's case. With it, Du Bois anticipated the central idea that a Black Briton will likely feel both Black and British, able to adopt both perspectives, but fully at home in neither. Furthermore, Du Bois was himself a fine example of the diasporic experience, given his early studies in Europe and later residence in Africa. Gilroy mentions the globetrotting exploits of other thinkers familiar to us, like Frederick Douglass, Martin Delaney, Anna Julia Cooper, C.L.R. James, and Richard Wright. Such biographies show how the slave trade created the conditions for experiencing the Black Atlantic as a webbed network between the local and the global, posing a challenge to narrow nationalist perspectives. This was never a matter of one-way traffic, but involved the interpenetration, interconnection, and interchange between peoples and cultures in Africa, Europe, the Caribbean, and the Americas. The doubleness of the diasporic experience, pulled between identities of race and nationhood, makes the diasporic individual keenly aware of the porousness of these very identities. Again, following Du Bois, whom Gilroy credits as a pioneer in this respect, Gilroy uses music to show how diasporic black cultures have defied constricting binary frameworks. He mentions the Fisk Jubilee Singers, 
whose international performances of the spirituals Du Bois celebrated as engaging in a cross-cultural circulation that was still seen in 1990s rap music. As Gilroy notes, and as we discussed back in episode 83, Zora Neale Hurston questioned the authenticity of such performances. This kind of reaction is, for Gilroy, likewise a constant refrain in black culture. Once race has been introduced as a basis for political identity, great value is placed on living out that identity with sincerity and authenticity. Black power and Afrocentrism would be clear examples of the same dynamic. As Gilroy writes, the acquisition of roots became an urgent issue only when diaspora blacks sought to construct a political agenda that could guarantee the nationhood and statehood to which they aspired. But black music has always had a complicated relationship to its roots. It has mixed and matched cultural forms, as when reggae married American soul music to island rhythms. So 1990s black music, with its penchant for remixing, was just a particularly clear instance of a long-standing tendency. Here, Gilroy cites Amiri Baraka's phrase, the changing same. Nothing is more traditional in black culture than to take tradition and modify it. For Gilroy, this demonstrates the inescapability and legitimacy of mutation, hybridity, and intermixture. What about the word modernity, which also appears in Gilroy's subtitle? It points towards the considerable ambition of this book. He wants to argue for a rethinking of the modern and the history of its critique. Much of what he describes when talking about music would fall under the heading of the postmodern, self-conscious and critical recombination of cultural forms and the patchwork aesthetics often tagged with the French word bricolage. It's usually thought that this sort of thing emerged only in the second half of the 20th century, but Gilroy suggests that postmodernity, in this sense, goes back pretty much as far as modernity, because it was going on already in diasporic communities, even in the time of slavery the singing of spirituals and work songs in the fields being an early and defining an example. Paul made a similar point once when reflecting on his diasporic background. Now that in the postmodern age, you all feel so dispersed, I become centered. Furthermore, we didn't need to wait for 20th century French philosophers to see a fundamental critique of the Enlightenment rationality that we associate with modernity. 19th century Africana thinkers beat them to it and were enabled to do so by their double perspective as diasporic people. Gilroy says that Du Bois and Douglas already perceived modernity as ruptured by slavery. They saw that the very language of supposedly dispassionate reason was tainted when it was used to justify the racial terror of slavery. This is not necessarily to pass a definitive judgment on reason, as it was understood in the Enlightenment. Gilroy says that it is an open question whether modern rationality sanctions or subverts the unfreedoms of the slave system. His point is more a historical one, namely that this very question was first raised in the diasporic tradition, and far earlier than we normally suppose. This means that grappling with the thought of the Black Atlantic means rewriting the history of ideas. One appealing feature of Gilroy's book is that he positively revels in showing that other thinkers have anticipated his ideas. He does this with Du Bois, of course, but also numerous women thinkers, including Toni Morrison. Gilroy notes that his central thesis was already powerfully articulated by Morrison in an interview that she gave to none other than Gilroy himself, in which she said, Modern life begins with slavery. Black women had to deal with postmodern problems in the 19th century earlier. These things had to be addressed by Black people a long time ago. Certain kinds of dissolution, the loss of, and the need to reconstruct certain kinds of stability. Which leads us nicely to Hazel Carby, our second graduate of the Birmingham School. She too applied the methods of cultural studies to earlier Africana thinkers in her books Reconstructing Womanhood and Race Men, which were published in 1987 and 1998 respectively. Both illustrate the power of those methods. The later book, Race Men, may remind us of Gilroy in that it covers significant Africana thinkers of the past, like Du Bois, along with figures from popular culture, like the actor Danny Glover. We would, however, like to focus on Reconstructing Womanhood, since it engages interestingly with the themes from Black feminism we covered in our recent series of episodes on the topic. Again, the subtitle is informative here, The Emergence of the Afro-American Woman Novelist. As this promises, Carby looks back to the fiction of several authors from the 19th and early 20th centuries, especially Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, Pauline Hopkins, and Nella Larson. The book is thus a work of literary history and a very informative one at that. For instance, it sheds light on Larson, a figure we must admit to having neglected, 
as an incisive critic of Africana thought around the time of the Harlem Renaissance. Larson's 1928 novel, Quicksand, argues Carby, depicts the limitations of the contemporary African-American intellectual scene by showing its main character, Helga, failing to be liberated by a combination of an emerging black middle-class morality and the still influential ideology of racial uplift. Unlike Zora Neale Hurston, Larson does not see traditional folk culture as a solution either. She has Helga move to the South, Hurston's cultural hunting grounds, and Helga is no less alienated from the people she finds there. The novel is also notable for having at its center what Carby calls the first truly sexual black female protagonist in Afro-American fiction. The novel shows the dangers of repressing sexual desire, it also the way that motherhood can stifle women. Consistently with the themes of cultural studies as practiced by Hall and Gilroy, Carby emphasizes the way that mixed race characters, like Helga in Quicksand, were used by these early novelists to depict passages back and forth across boundaries of race and class. And then there's the introductory chapter, which lays out Carby's motivation and method for the whole study. She says that she is interested in the historical transformation of ideologies, in this case, those concerning womanhood. Her later book, Race Men, does the same with masculinity. Carby also responds directly to the black feminist movement, and in particular to Barbara Smith's groundbreaking essay, first published in 1977 and then reprinted in a collection we've mentioned a few times, All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave. Smith's piece, which we discussed in episode 127, was called Toward a Black Feminist Criticism, and was important for outlining a project of exploring literature by black women. For Carby, though, the essay suffers from the sort of essentialism also critiqued by Hall and Gilroy. Smith was interested in black women authors, primarily lesbians, who managed to encapsulate the experiences of people like themselves. For Carby, this confines black feminist criticism to black women critics of black women artists depicting black women. As a product of the CCCS, Carby does not see identities as single, fixed things around which to build a literature or a critical discourse. Rather, identities are, as we've seen, shifting, plural, subject to negotiation and renegotiation. Thus, she writes that a black feminist criticism cannot afford to be essentialist and ahistorical, reducing the experience of all black women to a common denominator, but should rather be a problem, not a solution, a locus of contradictions. One provocative consequence is that, while women of today should certainly look back to and appreciate earlier authors like Nella Larson or Zora Neale Hurston, it is naive for them to do so in a spirit of straightforward solidarity or sisterhood. These women lived in a very different time and place, and what counted as womanhood for them, and for that matter the racism and sexism they faced, was necessarily very different than it would be for a woman reading and writing today. By criticizing Smith this way in her 1987 book, Carby also anticipates the critique of essentialism in the black feminist epistemology of Patricia Hill Collins that Gilroy would go on to offer some years later in the Black Atlantic. As you've probably noticed by now, black British cultural studies was critical in numerous senses of that word, but it was not immune to criticism itself. One complaint has been that the very focus of this movement on culture is a retreat from more engaged, explicitly political action or discourse. That may seem a plausible complaint, are we really going to reach liberation by talking about reggae or Danny Glover's role in the Lethal Weapon movies? But in fact, this rather blunt accusation fails to take seriously the central insight of the school, which is that the cultural just is political, in which case no political movement can afford to ignore popular culture. Hall himself said that cultural studies matters because culture is where groupings strive for dominance, adding that otherwise, I don't give a damn about it. A more sophisticated version of the same complaint has, however, been presented by another important Jamaican thinker, the late philosopher Charles Mills, in an essay on Hall that can be found in his book, Radical Theory, Caribbean Reality, Race, Class, and Social Domination. This is a sophisticated and appreciative, though critical, assessment of Hall's views on race. It calls attention to the gradual shift in those views across Hall's career, which Mills summarizes as a transition from Marxism to postmodernism. As Mills readily admits, the transition is closer to a change of emphasis than a change of mind. Even earlier in his writing career, Hall was never an orthodox Marxist. As we saw, he questioned the idea that race, or anything else in social and political life, can be explained entirely with reference to materialist economic causes. Then, later in the more postmodern phase of his career, he was still describing himself as an adherent of Marxism. 
but Mills detects a shift nonetheless, whereby class relations are invoked as at least partial causes in earlier essays, while the later essays seem to make everything a play of interpenetrating cultural influences and resistances. This brings Mills to his version of the aforementioned accusation that Hall is too interested in culture and not interested enough in politics, insofar as taking account of politics means acknowledging the power of economic class. The later Hall, and as we've seen, members of the Hall School, like Gilroy and Carby, are convinced that race is malleable and always being revised, because, like other cultural phenomena, it is socially constructed. To which Mills replies that race is indeed a matter of social construction, but the social phenomena it involves are in important ways less malleable than this focus on culture would suggest. Race is, as Mills puts it, tied up with unreconstructedly old-fashioned matters of economic privilege and disadvantage, of access to and exclusion from job opportunities and wealth creation, of class mobility and class stasis. You cannot just decide to resist these things the way you could decide to adopt a subversive reading of a television program. And where oppositional black culture does exist, Mills doubts its power to change economic reality. As he points out, plenty of white people are happy to dance to hip hop at night while holding on to their white privilege by day. Alongside this political critique of Hall, Mills also voices misgivings about Hall's theoretical approach. As we just said, the shift from Marxism to postmodernism in his essays is a subtle one, subtle in part because the early Hall and the late Hall make use of both paradigms, albeit in different proportions. But Mills asks, does this really make sense? Is Marxism, with its insistence on material causality, really compatible with a postmodernist account of everything as a function of cultural signification? Hall may be presenting us with what Mills calls a theoretical melange, combining things that ultimately don't mix. Whether this is a telling criticism or not is not a question we will adjudicate here, but we would at least note that if Mills has identified a weakness of Hall's thought, it is a weakness born of his greatest strength and most powerful insights. After all, cultural studies as he practiced it and the diasporic life as he lived it were all about exploring the blurry spaces between opposing forces and refusing to pick a side. Another theoretical approach devised by another major Caribbean thinker of the 20th century has much in common with Hall's. We have in mind Edouard Glissant and the focus that he and other important Martinican thinkers placed on the cultural process of creolization. Like the work of Hall and the CCCS, thinkers of creolization explore aesthetic productions in light of the cultural mixing, and indeed remixing, that colonialism inflicted on all who were affected by it. So powerfully does it resonate with the ideas of Hall that it's no surprise to find Hall devoting one of his many essays to creolization and asking how Glissant's claim that the whole world is becoming creolized relates to his own ideas about hybridity and cultural syncretism. In this essay, Hall tentatively concludes that the notion of creolization may apply more appropriately to the special circumstances of the colonial and post-colonial Caribbean than it does in other places and times. It's a typically nuanced and, to use Hall's own word, interrogative response to Glissant. Hall was, after all, the great exponent of the mixed message. But unlike him, we strongly prefer that you do not resist our message, which is plain and clear. Don't miss the next episode on Glissant and Creolization here on the History of Africana Philosophy. Mm -hmm.